Hey everyone, Mr. Walker here. In this lesson, I'm going to be talking about the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. For the most part, I'm going to be using this one slide here, this one diagram to talk about everything that you do need to know in regards to the hydrologic cycle. But quite often, what I like to do is just draw a very simple diagram. So let me just show you what that would look like, a very simplified diagram that I might draw. What it does need to include is all the different parts of the biosphere. So that includes the lithosphere that I'm starting to draw here. I'll just put L for the lithosphere. It includes the hydrosphere. And I'll just put in the oceans. But of course, the hydrosphere does include some other things as well, bodies of water. We have the atmosphere up in the air. And also the cryosphere. So if we add in the cryosphere, let's just make kind of a mountain here. And on top of this mountain at a higher elevation where the temperatures are colder, we can have some ice and we'll make that the cryosphere. And of course, we also need to have some biological organisms. So quite often what I'll do is just draw some plants. So this is maybe representing a tree. We can maybe have some aquatic plants as well some of the algae and some of the um, other aquatic plants that you might find. And of course, animals. I'm not going to try to draw some animals, but some land animals and some aquatic animals. So when we do talk about the different cycling, whether it is the hydrologic cycle that we're talking about right now, or the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the carbon cycle, you should try and include all of these different parts of the biosphere and then begin to talk about all of the different things that you need to know. So what are all of those different things that you do need to know? Well, you need to know the major reservoir, which is where you find most of that particular compound or element. Uh, sometimes there's more than one major reservoir. You need to know the different chemical forms. You need to know the cycling pattern, how we do have the chemical or the compound that moves from one component of the biosphere to the other. You need to know the names of those processes that's going to move the compound or element from one part of the biosphere to the other. And you need to know the human impacts. So if we do take a look at this picture here, let's just kind of orient ourselves. We do have the lithosphere over here on the left. We do have the hydrosphere over on the right. Up high, of course, we have the atmosphere, and we even have some of the cryosphere. So the five different things, where do you find most of the water? Pretty straightforward with some things with the hydrologic cycle. Where you find most of the water, the major reservoir is going to, of course, be, well, in the hydrosphere. And most of that is going to be in the oceans. But like I said, keep in mind that there are other components of the hydrosphere as well. So there are lakes, there are streams. Notice that there's also groundwater here as well. So all of those, in fact, are different parts of the hydrosphere. That is where we find most of the water. But it does exist in the atmosphere. It obviously exists in the form of the cryosphere as well. That is still water. And it also passes through. It makes up a major component of biological organisms. In this picture here, we do see some vegetation. We do see some trees and maybe some grass. But they don't have any animals, whether it's terrestrial or aquatic animals in this particular picture. But that's OK. So those are the, um, or that is the major reservoir, the hydrosphere, when we are talking about the hydrologic cycle. Secondly, the different chemical forms. Again, pretty straightforward with the hydrologic cycle because there is only one chemical form, and that is, well, good old H2O. But remember that water can exist in different states. So when we're talking about water in the hydrosphere, it is in the liquid state. When we're talking about water in the atmosphere, well, it actually can be in the liquid state but it can also be in the gaseous state, vapor, and it can also be in the solid state. Cryosphere, of course, is solid. When we talk about biological organisms, it's usually in the liquid state that we're talking about, and kind of the same with the liquos, uh, lithosphere as the water is kind of trickling and percolating through the lithosphere. It is typically also in the liquid state as well. But in all cases, again, there is just one chemical form, and that is in the form of H2O. Third thing you need to know are the processes, cycling processes, and what sort of goes along with that is the movement. So the cycling processes are kind of the names. The process or the flow is the direction that we do have. The water, in this case, going from one portion of the 
um, biosphere to another portion. So let's start where we do find most of the water, which again is going to be in the oceans. So how does it move from the oceans into the other parts of the biosphere? Some of this pretty straightforward. So if we take a look at this here, what is it showing? Well, it's trying to show that we have water in the liquid form that's going from the hydrosphere and up into the atmosphere. And of course, that is the process of evaporation. So movement from the liquid to the gaseous state from the hydrosphere to the atmosphere, that is evaporation. We can make this a very short cycle. We can just take that water from the atmosphere it can condense and then fall back into the uh, hydrosphere once again. So from the liquid, or sorry, from the gaseous form, it can condense and form the liquid form, and then it can fall back down as precipitation. So try not to write too much on the board here. This would be our evaporation, this arrow. This would be the condensation, this arrow here. And this would be the precipitation, the water that's falling back down to the hydrosphere. What this also shows, or is trying to show, is uh, we can also have wind currents that are moving that evaporated water up in the atmosphere, away from the oceans, and now over top of the land. Well, we still have then, over top of the land, condensation, and we still have precipitation, only now, that precipitation in the liquid form is going to end up on the lithosphere. So from the lithosphere, it can then go into the lakes, the rivers, and the streams, and it can be taken up by biological organisms. So taken up by plants, taken up by animals as well. I'll just write the word animals rather than trying to draw one. Water taken up from the lithosphere by the animals. Of course, this can take place in the uh, hydrosphere as well. So there are going to be plants and animals in the hydrosphere, and that water can be taken up by plants and animals directly from the hydrosphere. From the atmosphere, if we just continue this diagram over a little bit further here, so not only can we have condensation and going from the gaseous form to the liquid form in the atmosphere, if it is really cold, if it is higher up and if it's at extreme latitudes, polar latitudes, then we can have that liquid that is being converted into the solid state and then falling as, it says here, ice and snow as well. So that can eventually accumulate and even in the liquid form it can eventually accumulate and form the frozen cryosphere whether it is the glaciers that we see here or whether it's at the polar ice caps the north and the south pole. So we've completed the cycle um, in some ways. Uh, we do still need to sort of return a bunch of this water back to the oceans. So that water that falls on the uh, lithosphere, where can it go? Well, it can simply travel through lakes and rivers and streams, surface what we call runoff. So all of this here is runoff that eventually is going to return that water back to the oceans. We can also have this here, water that's kind of percolating or infiltrating way down below the surface of the lithosphere and into the groundwater. So this groundwater, in fact, can remain in this location and sort of isolated from the remainder of the hydrosphere, hydrosphere for hundreds and in some cases even um, thousands of years as well. So from the plants and the animals, I'm going to have to erase some of this here because it's getting a little bit messy, but if we leave the plants and animals still a couple of other sort of important processes that we do need to talk about. So we do need to have the liquid, the water that is in the plants and the animals eventually returning to the other parts of the biosphere as well. So in the case of the animals, that is returned to the atmosphere through the process of uh, perspiration and even exhalation. Breathing is going to return it to the atmosphere. It can return to the lithosphere and in the case of aquatic animals, return it to the hydrosphere through urination. I won't draw, draw those ones on here, but I will do this one because this is kind of a big one. This one right here, I think, is what it's trying to show is from the plants. So water is taken up by the plants through the roots. It travels up through the stem or the trunk, if we're talking about trees, to reach the leaves, which is the site of photosynthesis. But also, in order to get that water flowing up through and being released from the leaves 
we do have to have the process of transpiration. Water does need to be drawn up, and water loss is vital for that transport of the water from the roots and eventually up to the leaves for photosynthesis to take place. So I will write this one on the board here. So water that is going from the leaves of trees and plants up into the atmosphere, that is the process of transpiration. And again, there's well, a similar process that is taking place in animals, and that is sweating or perspiration. So now we've completed uh, pretty much all of the cycling that is taking place and the cycling processes. So just to remind you of a couple of those different names and processes that we do have, we see on the board here transpiration, mentioned perspiration, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, infiltration, runoff, maybe one other one that I should mention here as well. We can have water that is going from the solid form that we see in the cryosphere and directly up into the gaseous form, and in fact going in the opposite direction as well. And both of these are given the same name, and that is called sublimation. So what we have so far, we've talked about the major reservoir, we've talked about the chemical forms, or in this case chemical states, we've talked about the cycling pattern, we've talked about the cycling processes, the last one, kind of a big one, human impacts. Humans have an enormous impact on the hydrologic cycle. So I do wanna point out here, we're not talking about how humans are impacting the quality of water in terms of water pollution. That is a different story, that's a different process, and that's not really what we're concerned about with the hydrologic cycle. What we're concerned about here is how humans are having an impact on these arrows. So is there anything that we are doing to speed up these arrows? to slow down these arrows, to completely block these arrows. So if we take a look at this one right here, what this is showing is groundwater that's eventually being returned to the hydrosphere or rather to the oceans. So what we are doing is, in many places around the world, drilling down to get that groundwater out. So we are depleting the groundwater. There is much, much lower groundwater in many areas. These are filling up uh, what are referred to as aquifers. And as we drain those aquifers, that means that there is much less of this going on, much less of that water that's being returned to the hydrosphere, returned to the ocean, coming from the groundwater. So a major impact on that Probably the biggest environmental issue that we hear about today is global climate change, which usually does mean global warming. And with global more warming, what we then have is more of this, the solar radiation that results in more evaporation. So it's increasing the amount of H2O that is found in the atmosphere. This uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, it in itself is a greenhouse gas, and it leads to more warming. So it's kind of a vicious cycle where warming increases water vapor in the atmosphere, which leads to more warming and more water vapor in the atmosphere. So we're kind of changing the distribution a little bit in terms of um, the amount of water that we do find in the atmosphere. We're having an enormous impact on these things here. The glaciers, and even more so on the polar ice caps. So we are really changing the distribution. We're taking a lot of that stored water that's held up in the polar ice caps and converting it into the liquid form. Again, because of this here, global climate change and global warming. Um, another one as well, this arrow that we see where we're taking the water from the rivers and streams and returning it to the oceans, we're having an effect on that as well. So of course we put dams on rivers and streams and we minimize the flow in some cases of that water that's being returned to the ocean. We might use that water for irrigation, for crops for example, and from there of course it will be returned back up into the atmosphere through the process of transpiration. So many, many different things that uh, humans are doing to have an impact on water itself and most definitely also on the cycling pattern of water.